uh, webinar again. Uh, in the chat room there, I ask you to please type in where you're watching us from. I can see we have people from different parts of the world. Um, so it's very nice to see you. Um, thank you, Jimena, for offering the opportunity of delivering the webinar again. Last time, uh, we couldn't have uh, enough room for everybody. So we thought that it was only fair to deliver the session again. And uh, as Jimena said, I work for Richmond. I'm uh, the academic and sales consultant for the Southern Cone here in, in, in Latin America. But I'm also a teacher and a teacher trainer. And uh, I thought that it was interesting to look into ways in which we can uh, teach language skills um, from a very practical perspective. So the idea of this webinar is mainly to to look into activities that we can use in the classroom, either to combine the coursebook or to use uh, any online resources that uh, are available uh, on the web. So before we start, um, I would like to, to uh, share with you a poll of questions. It's, there are simply four questions uh, that I would like you to answer. Um, so let me just share with you the the poll of questions okay so now you should be able to look at the four questions okay remember to scroll down to look at all the questions and start answering um the 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 questions in the meantime uh let me tell you that this session is being recorded um Hime will be the moderator of this webinar um, so if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat room. I will be answering questions by the end of the session. Uh, during the presentation, I will be looking into the activities, as I said, but, um, but I will focus on, on answering questions at the end. Unless there is something really urgent, uh, Hime will stop me and she will, she will share uh, any urgent question with me in the process. Um, I can see you're answering questions. This is good for me to know more or less the audience that I have. Wow, we have many people who are already even um, joining, so we should give them some, some minutes. Um, the idea of asking these questions is uh, for me to do sort of a diagnosis and needs analysis to see, to, to get to know my audience a little bit more. I'm sure you will understand. Uh, oh, we have someone who's celebrating his birthday today. Happy birthday, Roberto. Uh, good. We, I have some fellow colleagues here from uh, Uruguay also joining, Guatemala. I see in the meantime, I, I'm just, I, I keep on looking at where you're visiting us from. That's, I, I, I love, I love webinars. I, I think this is a great uh, tool that we have nowadays. So not everything has been that bad uh, in COVID times. Um, so, Let's see, I'll, I'll give you one more minute to keep casting your votes because more people are joining the room. The questions are in terms of skills, in terms of degrees of confidence, in terms of differences between online and face-to-face -face teaching and in, ter in terms of resources, as you can see. Um, and I believe we could get started. Let me just put an end to the voting. Well, more people are entering the room, so uh, I should. Okay, I'll, I'll just give you one more minute, and 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 that's it. And I will share the results with you. Lots of people from Ecuador. Lovely. Fantastic. 
it's, it's, it's really amazing to see all the number of people that are with us today. Okay, so time's up. Um, we have 68% of the people who casted their votes. Let's uh, share, let's put an end to this. So results, guys, these are the results. This is who we are. Um, which skill do you practice the most online? Interesting, look at this. Uh, most of you do listening online. In, um, I think it was last Tuesday that we, we delivered this same webinar and the answers were different. Uh, most people did reading online at the time. Um, again, here reading is uh, second place in terms of importance, but with you guys, most of you are doing listening. What does not surprise me uh, is that writing seems to be the skill that we practice the least. And the reason why it doesn't surprise me is because I think that if we consider this from a, even from a face-to-face -face perspective, writing generally tends to be the skill that we pra practice the, the least in the classroom. Um, we will be looking into ways of doing writing online today as well. Um, and we will look into ways of doing listening, uh, but also speaking, uh, because I believe speaking is, is a skill that we need to practice a lot if we want students to communicate. So we will have a balance of all four skills. And most importantly, what I will try to show you is how we can integrate skills, even when we are mainly working with one of them. In terms of confidence, uh, because we have been with COVID for so long now, uh, I, I can see most of you are fairly confident and hooray for, to all of you for that. Uh, I think that we are learning a lot on how to, to teach online. Uh, so I can see that most of you are confident or fairly confident. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, you will feel very confident at teaching uh, skills online. Uh, I still have a timid 18% uh, of people who are not very confident. Don't worry, I'm sure you're not alone. Uh, and we will help you be, become a bit more confident. Um, in terms of differences, yeah, there are differences. But what we will be looking at is that even though there are differences, it is not that we really need to relearn how to do uh, how to work with skills online. Actually, I think this is something that we need to, to be positive about. Teaching online does not mean to go through training again, okay? Lots of the things that we know about language teaching can be applied to online instruction. So uh, bear with me and you will see. And in terms of the materials that you use, fortunately, the, the vast majority is uh, using a combination of both. The, the course book and uh, the online resources uh, available uh, online. So without further ado, let's get started. I won't be looking at the chat room now, so uh, I will concentrate on the um, agenda for today. And basically for the agenda, I have two big things. One of them is to discuss the advantages of online instruction. I won't be looking into the disadvantages because that's something that you know, and it's something that uh, I think it's not worth focusing on at the moment because the only option we have of instruction is the, the online one. So let's look at the positive things and the, the bright side of the story. And then we will be looking into activities that we can implement either using your course book or the online resources or a combination of both. And before we start, uh let's let's uh focus on each skill separately we will be looking at reading online and in order to look to do online reading i have here a selection of six statements that i want you to think about them and to decide whether these are right or wrong uh, pieces of information okay uh, we won't be doing live uh, voting uh, at this point. Uh, I will be telling you the answers as, as I discuss the statements. 
Um, you can look at all six of them, um, and I will give you some reflection time. But let's begin with the first one. It says that number one says the structure of a reading lesson is different in an online lesson. And this is a question I've been asked a lot by colleagues. Um, because I do teacher training, uh, they tell me whether they need to change the way of teaching. Um, something that we need to remember here is the difference between synchronic and asynchronic instruction. And for those who don't know, in a nutshell, synchronic means online with them at the same time. Asynchronic means you setting an activity, they do the activity while you're not connected, and then you share uh, results. I think that in online times of instruction, both of them need to be applied. And the reason is because sometimes we don't have any other option. So we really need to know how to play with the synchronic and the asynchronic. And when we talk about asynchronic, we talk about flipped learning. Um, one of my colleagues from uh, Chile delivered last week an amazing webinar on uh, flipped learning, and she's going to repeat it, if I'm not wrong, this Thursday again. Um, and I highly recommend you uh, also attend that webinar because in these times, we need to play with the synchronic and the asynchronic instruction. Now, when it comes to the structure of a reading lesson or the structure of a listening lesson, okay, um, it doesn't change really, okay? You would still have your pre, your while, and your after, or your pre, your while, and your post, or the follow-up, okay? So you would have the three stages of work for working with the lesson. That does not change. So the same thing that we did in the classroom, we will be doing online. And the reason is because in order to work with a text, we need to prepare students for working with that text. We need to work with the text and then we need to build up uh, on the information that we got from that text. What we'll be looking at is what of those three stages could be done synchronically or could be done asynchronically. And that will depend on different factors. Okay, and that leads us to number two. It says, whether learners do the reading task in the lesson or for homework depends only on their age. And the answer for this is wrong, okay? It doesn't only necessarily depend on age, okay? It depends, it might depend on the focus of the lesson, okay? Whether in this case, we are talking about reading. So it, it has to do with age, but it also has to do with the focus of instruction, okay? Um, number three says, young learners are more likely to read texts in the lesson. And this is true. Uh, during this webinar, I will focus on all age levels, uh, primary, secondary, and adult education. And something that is true is that with the little ones, six, seven, I would even say eight years old, that are uh, embarking on the process of decoding text in the foreign language, they might need to do the while reading with us in the classroom, okay? Uh, so that means during the synchronic moments of the lesson. We cannot ask a six-year-old or a seven-year-old to do reading uh, independently offline, asynchronically, because that will just lead to a real nightmare for mommy, daddy, and the kid. So we need to understand that with children, some of these uh, reading instruction will be doing synchronically and some will be doing asynchronically. Now, when we do synchronic work, meaning reading with them uh, on a face-to-face -face basis, what we need to make sure is that the text is not too long. It, it would be really important to focus at the level of paragraph, okay? Not to focus at the level of whole text instruction. Because if we do whole, whole text uh, instruction with the little ones, what we'll, what we'll see is a lot of kids um, looking down, reading silent moments in a very valuable face-to-face -face online instruction. Um, sorry, in, a, in an online instruction process that is not face-to-face, -face, but, but is synchronic. So uh, when you're going to do um, while reading, make sure that you don't work with whole text, you just work with paragraphs. 
Now, number four says, if the lesson focus is reading for specific information, the learners can do the reading in class. And the answer to this is correct, okay? It's right. We also, whether it's children, teenagers, or adults, whenever we are working with specific information, reading at the level of specific information, it's better that we do it synchronically. What is reading for specific information? This is when we ask students to work with different sub skills, and this is because we are teaching the sub skills, such as, for example, inferencing, sequencing, uh, understanding, uh, gist, whatever. Okay, when it's specific information, we really like to do that synchronically because this is a teaching moment in the reading lesson. So we will devote that uh, for our synchronic moment. If we are working with a text using skills that uh, sub skills that students already knew, then uh, or that already students already know, sorry, then we will be doing the while reading asynchronically. Now, number five says that if the lesson focus is reading for detailed information, the learner. is correct. Information is simple things that, for example, understanding, uh, for example, referencing, okay, in uh, international exams. Uh, what does it in line uh, 20 something uh, refer to? Or also uh, detailed information could be the purpose of the, the writer, okay, or the mood of the, of the author. Those detailed things, okay, those are things that can be assessed asynchronically and that they don't necessarily need uh, to be online with us when they are discussing this. Uh, so that, th those could be types of activities that are good for asynchronic instruction. And finally, when learners read a text for homework, the next lesson can focus on checking the learner's understanding and follow-up work. And of course, that is correct, okay? Uh, the richness about uh, synchronic instruction is that we really uh, do this after reading, this uh, post-reading with them, because this is a moment in which we can integrate skills and in which we can build up from the content of the text. So remember to use those moments, okay, of correction for the synchronic times, uh, and also the uh, integration of more skills, all right? So this is how we will be working with uh, this, um, the, the, the organization of the lesson. Now, in terms of advantages, I think one of the advantages about doing uh, online instruction is that we can now benefit from the wide range of materials that is available online. When we're uh, teaching with a course book, sometimes teachers really focus too much on the content that appears in the book. And as we know, the book is fantastic because I always say that it's kind of like a life jacket, all right? It's, it's, it's uh, material that I have there with all the skills, with language instruction, and is the sort of material that allows me to go and celebrate my, my kid's birthday during the weekend and not feeling guilty on Monday because I couldn't plan my lesson really well or because I, I couldn't expand uh, the material that I have in, in my, my course book. So we need to remember that course books are that. It's just a compilation of materials accurately organized that will help me. But the richness of a course book is is if that course book allows me to also expand it, okay? And during the school year, sometimes we don't always have the time to go online and, and look for materials, but now we have no other choice, so we should benefit from the wide range of material that is available online. The other, the other benefit that we have is that all this content is uh, constantly updated. So we are offering students um, content that is um, really fresh. And you probably know this because sometimes we are working with a, with a book and the book, let's say we are reading about a famous person, a sportsman or a famous actor or actress, and uh, it says that they have two children. And actually nowadays that person has three children. And that is updated online. So now that we are using uh, online material, we get the opportunity of um, really having all the material fully updated. And if we are going to combine that, 
uh, the, the, if we are going to combine the course book and the online material, this is a great opportunity for students to do research and to contradict the book if they feel that the book is outdated, okay? Um, the other thing is the, the wide range of text typology that uh, we can expose students to, okay? We can expose students not just to stories or articles that generally appears in, in books, but we can also expose them to posts, we can expose them to blogs, we can expose them to wikis. So we can really expand the range of text typology that we can teach them about, and which of course then we can connect them into writing. The other thing is about uh, is that learners uh, are more used to reading online than reading from print books. So this is really great for us because now we are giving them the sort of reading that they are used to doing. Okay, now something that we need to remember uh, about online instruction is that we are now swimming into deep waters. And why do I say this? It's not deep waters because teaching online is unknown for us, but also because we are getting into things, into fields that is their field, okay? The online world is the, the student's instruction, is, is the student mode, let's say. So we need to be very cautious about what we ask them to do, how we ask them to do stuff, because this is their environment, it's not our environment, okay? So let's make sure on how we can, uh, how we make use of this. Having said that, I really want to demystify the idea that uh, students are digital natives. They are digital natives for some things, but not for everything. They're not digital natives in terms of being educated through the computer and online. They are digital natives in terms of using apps, using some software, but they are not necessarily digital natives in terms of how to use Zoom or how to use some educational platforms. And that's something that we also should bear in mind because sometimes we give, uh, we take for granted that they really know everything and they need to be instructed about this as well. So let's remember that some of those things are their reality, but some are not their reality and that we still need to do some teaching, okay? Um, and finally, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to promote more extensive reading. And we are all teachers, we know the value of extensive reading in terms of the richness, of uh, picking up vocabulary, being exposed to language structures at different levels, different content. So let's benefit from that and let's expose students to that. So without further ado, let's start into the practical things, which is what I uh, promise. And the first activity that I will suggest is a reading race. And the reason why I selected this activity is because sometimes we are faced with a book page like this. This is a, a children course book. And here students will need to read about an island. It's called the, the um, Takais Island. Of course, this is a made up island. And, and these things happen in course books. Sometimes kids are reading about things that are not even uh, real or that are strange because this is a fiction story, okay? But how can we make this more motivating? And how can I uh, do some pre-reading activity for this? What I suggest now that we will be working a lot with computers is always prepare a, a set of general knowledge questions and give it to students. But how are you going to give these general knowledge questions? For example, for this lesson, I prepared these five general knowledge questions. For example, how many islands are there in the world? or where is the Polynesia, and uh, which is the largest island in the Polynesia, or how far is your home country from the Polynesian islands, and who discovered the Polynesian islands. But I'm not going to give all these questions to them in a pre-reading lesson that, of course, I will be doing asynchronically. Um, I would like to do this synchronically to build up motivation into reading because this text, uh, with the strategies uh, and the sub-skills that this text demands are very simple. So I will 
devote the while reading uh, for asynchronic purpose. But I need to build up motivation. This is another issue I've been asked a lot. How do I motivate my students with this distant education? Sometimes it's preparing these kind of things, and these kinds of things are games, because the way I'm, I'm going to organize this is we're all going to be uh, connected as we are now and I, I will be using the chat room with my students and I will be delivering one question at a time so I will write one question in the chat room and they will have to go to Google and start looking for the answer this is expanding reading is also helping them uh, get more general knowledge. And then students will have to, once they find the answer, they will have to type in the answer into the chat room. Now, this is up to you whether you allow copying and pasting, okay? Because the idea of typing is that they also need to paraphrase, they need to practice their writing skills at a, at a um, short level. But this is up to you, okay? So you would you would uh, be checking, okay, who is the fastest, who is who gets the information right, and this really builds up um, interest. Now, of course, with online instruction, we need to make sure that everybody is learning, not just the students. We are also learning, and that remember the online uh, environment is there is the students' reality. So we really need to, um, to embrace students and to really empower them into, into this. So what are we going to do as a follow-up? We are going to ask students to prepare two or three general knowledge questions. And, they, uh, and then they will become the ones who start giving uh, questions to the class and also to us. In this modality, we need to understand that we are also part of the learning process. So we are part of the, these games. So they will uh, write questions and we will go and we will look for the answers and we will uh, type the answers. And this will become fast, uh, sorry, fun. And what will happen is that mommy and daddy who are at home, they are, they are looking at their kids and they are looking at their kids being active but not active, active sorry, uh, only from a responsive way. They are being active from a proactive way because uh, they can see their children also being doers in the action. So I always loved doing uh, reading races in my classrooms. Now, when I was in the face-to-face -face mode, I, I would use the cell phone for this and I would ask students to take out uh, their cell phones and to, do, uh, to use Google for that. I know that some schools, never allowed the use of cell phones in the classroom, but I think that now there is no excuse. So I really wanted to share this activity that I always used with my students. The other one is the five click away. This is a great activity because it would also, it would not just expand their reading opportunities. This is fantastic for extensive reading, but it's also an activity that will help me um, learn more about my students' reading interests. So the first thing that I will ask my students to do is uh, to find a website that has many links. An example of these types of websites are these news websites, for example, the BBC website or any website that has many, many, many links, as you can see there. I can click almost anywhere and I, it would direct me to a new page. What we are going to ask students to do is we are going to ask students to click five times and once they get to their fifth website or uh, from those links we would ask them to get a screenshot of that uh, site okay and that will be it students will just get a screenshot and then we would ask them to write a short summary on the content that they can find in that fifth website okay once they do that, they will upload the image of the fifth website and a short summary. This is fantastic for extensive reading purposes, as I said, and also to practice reading skills at the level of summarizing, okay? And this is fantastic because we can always tell students, okay, look, every single text is organized in paragraph and every single paragraph has an introductory line with an introductory 
three idea, then it has supporting ideas, or and, and then you would have a summary, okay, in each paragraph. So it would be fantastic for, for us to work with students on uh, paragraph organization and how all that builds up in a text and that they can use those introductory ideas from each paragraph and to build a, a summary, okay? Now, the good thing, as I said, is that doing this activity also enriches us uh, in terms of what they are interested in. And when we need to look for websites, now we know which websites we should be looking at. We need to go into the websites that we know our students are surfing, because those are the websites that would really get them motivated. And again, you are, you are able to see that one of my focus of this presentation is on how I can get students motivated in online times that we know it's not something students sign up for. None of our students sign up for full online delivery of lessons. So how we can keep them motivated is a must these days. And sometimes the question is, how can we be motivated? Because this is being very difficult for us. But again, the other focus of this presentation is helping you see how this can be really easy. Okay. The other one is a blog log. Um, one of the things that are that is online uh, a lot is blogs. There are many people writing online. Uh, I love blogs because I think it's an opportunity of giving people a voice. So uh, we are going to ask students to look into blogs and to read blogs. Why? Because when it comes to writing, Blogging is a way of writing, but in order to know how to blog, I need to be a good reader of different blogs available. So we are going to ask students to have uh, to create a blog log. And for that, we're going to get students to choose a blog of their choice for some time. Let's say one month or two weeks or two months, okay? There, is, uh, there are websites that um, have a compilation of blogs. For example, I really like this website that is the 50 best blogs in the world. And there you have blogs for everything, sports, movies, business, you name it, okay? So these are blogs that you can recommend to students uh, if they are not blogging already and if they don't have a blog that they are following. So you can, get students to choose one or you can recommend one of your choice. And they will be following these blogs for some time. But you would ask students to create a blog log, okay? A blog log is like what we used to call in the face-to-face -face, uh, times, the writing logs. We are going now to have uh, blog logs. So, this is an example of the blog log. You're going to ask students to complete this form. Um, first of all, they are going to write their name. They're going to write the name of the blog that they are following. They're going to also write the address for that blog. They're going to write the topic, okay? Is it about sports, movies, famous people? Well, I don't know. Business, you name it. Then we are going to ask students to detail all the entries, okay? So for all the different entries, all the different posts that appear in the blog and that they read, they're going to write there the titles of those entries. They're going to give us the link and they're going to share our, their reaction, whether they liked it, they didn't like it, whether they, whether they think that it was interesting, why it was interesting, etc. After that, they're going to write an overall summary of the blog. And finally, they need to personalize it. So they need to write a recommendation. Do you recommend this blog? Yes, no, why? Who would this blog be uh, interesting and useful for? Etc. Etc. And once they have their blog log, they will share it with their uh, classmates in the forum. Why? Because this is not just information for us in terms of seeing how much reading they are doing and um, 
also to check their writing, but because these will be uh, pieces of uh, source of uh, information for the classmates. And then, as you can see, you're not selecting blogs, you're not recommending blogs. Now it's your students recommending the blogs. So here we are, we started the process of students doing the work for us. It's not us spending hours and hours online looking for material. Now the students are recommending the material. Now the students are doing all the research and all the information for us. While well, we get to enjoy our weekends, okay? Because the pre-selection of material is done from our students. And I loved this because I'm a strong believer that students need to be the center of instructions. They need to be the doers. So as you can see, as you will see in all the activities that I will suggest today, there are activities in which I get the student at the center of uh, instruction and in which the students are the producers and I just benefit and my job will be to administrate all this information and all this material that my students will be collecting. Let's be honest, if I have, let's say, uh, 100 or 200 students a year and I get all of them researching and looking for material while creating, then I have 200 researchers of materials that will give me lots of inf information that I will later on administrate and uh, I will make my online teaching a lot easier. Good. Another activity <clears throat> that I, I have is short stories. Um, we know that stories, the, the, the story genre is, is, is key to language instruction. We ask students <clears throat> to read for novel, to read novels, uh, to read short stories. I wouldn't say ask students to read long stories online because that will be boring. Let's remember that we are teaching the generation of the 140 character type of students, meaning those centennials, okay, that are used to writing messages, okay, uh, and are used to reading short texts. So the, if we are going to invade their world, which is the digital world, Let's not make it something boring, okay? So we need to go for the short stories ideas. So what we are going to do is we are going to choose a short story. This can be a short story that comes from your course book. And again, you we will be integrating the course book. Or uh, it could be a short story that you like and that is available online. And you are going to... Um, write a short review next to it. Again, this is all our work. We choose the story, we write the short review. If you don't have a short story in your course book, here are three of my favorite uh, short stories websites. And the reason why I love these websites is because you have stories for all age groups. You have stories that are organized by topic. So you have crime stories, love stories, you name it. Um, and they're also uh, great by uh, school level sometimes. So you really have stories for all types of, uh, all the variety of students that you may be teaching. So choose one. Oh, the other thing is sometimes you have the stories organized by word limits. So you have 25 short uh, 25 word short stories or 50 word short stories. Okay, so you choose one and you write a review. That will be this, the model, okay? And you will uh, share the story with your review in the uh, platform that you're using, whether it is your publisher's platform or whether it is uh, Schoology or Classroom or Edmodo, okay? Any platform you're using. Um, then you will get students to read the story and to comment on it uh, and your review. Uh, teacher, I think the story, your review is not, uh, does not do any uh, honest, uh, any right to, to, to the story because the story says this and you're very critical or this or that. Or I think you, you, your review is very, very interesting because it really summarizes I mean, get students to comment, okay? Teach students how to analyze a review. Why? Because of course, we will ask students to choose 
a story and to write at least, and I say at least because this will depend on the age group that you're teaching, at least a 25 word long uh, review to share to the classroom. Why are we doing this? First of all, because uh, writing reviews is, uh, is, is a type of text uh, that they need to, to do for some international exams levels. Uh, so they need to start uh, being uh, able to, to, to produce those kind of texts. But most importantly, guys, if we get all students to choose a story and to write a review, then we will have lots of information on which stories they liked and which stories they didn't like. So now we know which stories from these websites, for example, uh, we can keep on working with. Okay, so they already uh, pre-selected all the stories and now we know which stories we need to work with which are interesting. And again, the idea of motivation, how to keep my students motivated and interested in this uh, online instruction. Let's work with the material that they selected. And then you can keep on doing any of, uh, of the activities that I, I mentioned or that uh, I will mention using this text that they already pre-selected for you. You see, you just work with one and you will get a selection of 200 stories uh, with the comments already. The other activity is a jigsaw task. We all know about jigsaw reading activities. Let's implement it into, in the online uh, version now. So of course, what we'll, what we, sorry, what we'll do is, we will work with a story from our book or again, any of the website stories uh, that students preselected. This is an example of a, of a course book, okay? This is for six, seven years old students, eight, it will depend on when they start learning English, okay? And as you can see, comics is, uh, is a, ty is a ty uh, type of text that, um, that they read, okay? The graphic novel also. Um, so we can use a, a story from a website or a, or a book and what we will ask students to do is we will ask them to get into groups. If you're doing this synchronically through uh, Zoom, for example, I love teaching through Zoom. In Zoom, you know, there is a function that is called breakout rooms and breakout rooms is fantastic for speaking or any sort of collaborative, um, collaborative work. So you would ask students to uh, get into groups and you will assign each of these groups a reading task. This is fantastic for differentiating instruction purposes, okay? We know some students can read at some level or at other levels. They can mainly focus on the images, okay? So give each uh, group a different reading task. Once you have all students working on their tasks, then you create a different, uh, sorry, uh, I already said about creating a different task. Once they all, they, all, they all did their task, you will get all of them together to report the results in the forum. And this can also be done orally if you're doing the, the after reading in from a synchronic way. Okay, and what you will do is you will benefit from all the collaboration of the results of all the reading tasks. Okay, so if some students only needed to draw uh, an image of the lesson, if some students need to analyze the, the, the characters from some perspective, is some of them had to work with the lexis from the, the text. Depending on the different things, if some of them had to rewrite uh, the story into dialogue format, okay? You could assign different uh, activities to the, to the class and then you can ask them uh, to work all together as a group, okay? And recreate uh, the story in a different way. So jigsaw tasks is, are, is a fantastic way of doing reading. So these are five activities that I, I created for reading purposes. Let's go into writing now and let's start with the advantages for writing. One of the advantages, of course, is that uh, this can be book, uh, I mean, all these writings can be book or internet based. What do I mean by this? That we can still be doing the pieces of writing that can appear in our course books, 
Okay, and the reason why I strongly um, make reference to course books is because, well, not only because uh, I've worked for Richmond and I know that uh, all of you are, are using books, but because uh, at the time that COVID uh, hit our educational, uh, our school year, uh, some of us students bought the books and now mommy and daddy are asking us, it's like, okay, use the book. Don't just use all the activities that are online because I spent money on this material. So what I wanted to say is how we can uh, integrate the, the course book that students, um, that students bought into the activities, into the, the, the course book. Uh, or we can simply use the, the, the activities that we find online. So let's have a blend of both of them. The other thing is that there is a wide range of websites where students can upload their material. Um, we always talked about uh, writing portfolios. Okay, let's have a writing portfolio or let's have a class blog, okay? Um, we saw that we asked students to read blogs let's ask them to also produce a blog, all right? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking that many people are writing in the blog, in the chat room, Hime, I assume that uh, if something important happens, you will, you will interrupt me. Uh, yeah, don't worry, so it's generic questions about breakout rooms and how Zoom works, which is not the objective of your session. That's why I haven't interrupted you. Okay, I will just make a tiny little reference to that when, we, when I get into speaking. Um, so, uh, the, the wide variety of, of text types. Uh, if we ask them to read blogs, and that's why I selected the blog log activity, uh, let's ask them to become writers who have their class blog to become bloggers, okay? And this will be fantastic to also see their. Um, improvement during the months or even this entire school year because once we go back into the the classrooms we can keep on working with these blogs okay so let's let, let's ask them not just to write the traditional postcards and letters and emails that were always fake from the course book let's now ask them to write blogs to write wikis anything okay uh the other thing is that remember text needs to be short or long uh because everything is digital, and remember they are the generator of the 140 characters, even though Twitter now expanded the, the, the length of characters, um, let's remember that they need to write long and short texts. When we work online, it's important that we respect the, the online rules. The online rules for them is texts need to be short. So don't always ask them to write long texts. Ask them to write short texts as well, okay? Um, it's also very important that we remember that they need to publish, okay? So don't ask them to assign or to produce all the text to deliver to you by email or through private message in your platform, okay? Everything that they publish needs to be uh, done, uh, sorry, e everything that they write needs to be done so that they, they can publish it and they can be read by everybody. And I'm talking about even from a six-year-old to a 30, 40, 50-year-old person, okay? We all love seeing that whatever we produce can be shared with someone else. And the other thing that we need to remember is that there are many tools online to work with writing. And uh, not only do you have blogging tools, but you also have uh, tools to work to do uh, writing uh, collaboratively, like Google Docs. Okay, and in Google Docs, they can be writing uh, synchronically with you, and you can be entering their docs as they are writing. So it's like kind of monitoring in the classroom as they are writing, and they can be asking you questions as they are writing. So this is good because mommy and daddy see them in the in uh, at home really working and asking you a question, okay? Uh, and you can go and enter their Google Doc on the spot and see what it is that they are writing. They can be working collaboratively, so you can as assign them groups and they can be doing group writing. And again, you can be monitoring their group writing. 
So there are many ways in which we can really make this uh, um, online sort of instruction look like the face-to-face -face one. But I, it's very important for me to, to, to emphasize this. It's not that it will be the same. It will look like, but it won't be the same. I think we will immediately lose the battle if we really want to make online instruction like face-to-face -face instruction. The moment we try to do that, we lose the, the battle, and I would say we lose the war, okay? Because there are tiny differences, and we need to respect that. Differences have to do with timing, differences have to do with the type of activities, differences have to do with the sort of control, okay? In online instruction, the timing changes, the control needs to be 100%. Uh, on the student's hand, in the student's hand um, for some things. So we need to do away with this thing of us uh, being the center. And the other thing that I didn't mention when we, we talked about the blog log is that in online instruction, all the activities need to be clearly explained in writing, okay, so that students feel um, confident at the moment of doing that. All right, but enough about the preaching, let's talk about the activities. So the first one is your picture, my story. I always did this even from a, in, a, in the traditional face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, what I would ask students to do is I would ask students to look for striking pictures to tell a story, okay? Um, what we are going to do is they are going to go and to look for a striking picture okay and they they are going to upload the picture in the class forum and they are going to write also a theme okay um for that picture so they look for a picture and they say uh, i don't know uh crime or robbery or uh, i don't know cooking or sports okay they need to choose a theme together with a striking picture now a striking picture is a picture that it's it's a one of those wow pictures or it's a picture that is mm, how how do i look at this picture in order to understand the picture so it needs to be a striking picture it cannot be one of those obvious pictures okay so you can also role model what you mean by a striking picture but you looking for a striking picture and selecting a theme they can also do this from a picture, uh, using a picture from the course book. And this is fantastic so that they explore the course book. One of the crimes I think some teachers uh, commit is that they, they teach the book in order, okay? And students explore their book in that order. I was always a, a kind of teacher that I would let my students come and go in the book and look for things in the book, okay, and reuse the activities in the book, like reusing the pictures or re reusing texts, even texts that we haven't looked at, but reuse them for different purposes. I think the book, as I said, it's always a source of reference. It's not the syllabus for me. So you can ask them to go and to look for striking pictures in the book if you want to as well. Like for example, this view of a plane with lots of smoke, but there is also smoke coming up from, uh, from, the, from the ground. So what is that? Is one of those uh, planes that are hydrants or I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, so ask them to look for a picture. What you're going to do, then you're going to disrupt the uh, instruction. Students probably at this point think that you're going to ask them to look for the picture on a theme because they're going to work with that picture. But no, what you're going to do is you're going to disrupt their imagination and you're going to assign the pictures to totally different students, okay? So now students will not be working with the pictures that they chose and with the theme that they selected. You will reassign that and students will need to write a story with those pictures and those themes. So that will be puzzling because it's like a, a striking picture that I didn't select and now I need, I need to write the story. Once they write the story, uh, okay, students are going to um, write, uh, uh, sorry, 
once they have the picture, they're going to write the story based on the instructions. And remember what I said, give clear instructions. So you're going to tell them, for example, look at the picture and imagine you were there when that happened. Write an X number of uh, words, okay? So like a 100 word or 50, 100 word uh, entry telling your story. Include the following information, such as where you were, who you were with, what you saw, what you did, what happened, how you felt, etc., etc. Okay. When you finish, okay, proofread the story, and for that you can ask them to work with uh, the, the the reading plan. Okay, if your book has one, okay, with all the recommendations that uh, that your course book uh, has. Okay, so proofread the story and post it together with the picture in the in the forum. Okay, and it says there, answer any question your classmates make about the story, because you will need to get the students um, answering, uh, making questions about the stories, like, wow, and what did you do then? And why didn't you run to the, in this direction instead of that other direction? Okay, so make sure that students now start interacting with this text. Now, the cool thing about this, this is what I did when I was uh, teaching in the classroom, is that uh, I would then return the uh, picture, but now with the story, to the original owner of the, of the picture, okay? And I would ask them to write, okay, um, their original version of the story and to make a comparison okay so um it would be like my story was this and then the students can compare the two stories the students can also work with what they selected okay so it's it's very important that students really, that we don't always demotivate them, it's like, but teacher, you asked me to, to look for this picture, now I have to work with this stupid picture or this or that. Okay, no, they will always have their time to really create, to really do what they want. And then what you will have is two different texts and you can work with comparative texts, okay? And with the two versions of the story. So remember, remember to always do that. Every single piece of resource that your students give them, uh, give you, sorry, they can be used and they can be maximized for lots of different things, okay? So remember that. The other type of activity that I wanted to share with you is an activity I always use. Those who know me, who are from my country and know me, I always define myself as sort of a rebel, okay? I am uh, oh, I'm always questioning I, and, and I do things, uh, I'm a rebel, okay? And I always liked sharing, uh, using this in my classrooms, okay? Uh, so what I um, asked was uh, my students to write anti-protocols. And uh, in order to write anti-protocols, you need to get students into pairs or trios, that will depend on the number of students. And you need to ask students to think about things that shouldn't be done for something. For example, uh, you're going to ask them to write an anti-protocol with at least five recommendations, recommendations and share them in your class forum. An anti-protocol for uh, what you have to do if you have a computer pro problems can be this. This is the anti-protocol that I wrote. So first of all, panic which we know it's not what we, should, what we should do, okay? But remember, this is a way of asking our students to think backward, okay? To think from a different perspective. This is an activity that is demanding high levels of thinking, okay? Because it's not lower levels. It's not asking students to write things that they remember of what they have to do. No, they need to work at the creative level, the highest level of thinking, and they need to think about what not to do, okay? And it will be crazy, but students, especially teenagers, they love being uh, negative or they love uh, 
I don't know, contradicting everything. So it, it, it's very creative and it's fun. And as you can see, this is short piece, uh, it's a short piece of writing. So uh, my anti-protocol for the moments when you have uh, computer problems is first of all, panic. Uh, think that you have lost everything. Uh, do not ask for help. Nobody will be able to help you. Use through this app. Uh, shout at your computer and hit the keyboard. Probably you frighten your computer good enough and your computer will give you all the information back. And well, if not, we are all rich people. So just simply throw your computer away and buy a new one, all right? So these are five things that you know you should never do when you have a computer problem, okay? The cool thing about this, because this is so crazy, is that uh, then students will, um, will post this in, in their class uh, forum, okay, using your platform. And of course, here's where you will be working with your critical um, think, with students' critical thinking. And they will need to write uh, uh, based on the uh, anti protocols like, wow, this, would, this is just wild never do this, okay? Uh, I once actually did that. It was the, the worst mistake I did in my entire life. Uh, I, I, I tend to do this, but I just need to remind myself that I don't have to do that, okay? So it's, it's lots of fun. And there are many topics that we can present students uh, for them to write anti-protocols. One of them is how to improve their English, okay? That's a, a question that they ask us year after year, okay? Teacher, how can I improve my English, okay? Um, they know it by heart, but they still keep asking. So ask them to write their anti-protocol, okay? It's like, okay, what things shouldn't you do, okay, if you want to improve your English? Or how to study for their test, or how to have fun uh, on a Friday uh, night in your town, okay? And if you're teaching adults also, you can ask them how to do well in a job interview or how to be organized. There are different topics that we can ask students to write outside protocols for and uh, that they will have fun. And again, these are short pieces of writing. Okay. The other, the other activity, this is, um, I thought of this activity in order to help you how to integrate the traditional activities that may appear in your course book, how we can, um, do them online. This is the I like some information activity. And for this, you will need to pair up students uh, and you will need to assign roles. Why? Because this is the traditional role play activity that appears in course book materials, an activity in which you would have student A, who's a travel agent, and student B, who is a tourist and would like some information. Um, what you would ask them to do is you would ask them to write a text, okay? This text would be a, a dialogue, uh, okay? And this can be done interactively through email, through Google Docs, okay? But they will be working uh, interactively at the level of writing, okay? Once they have that, they need to, you will need to ask students to share the conversation with you. Now, remember, this is writing. So you can ask them to write the um, you can ask them to to write the final version and share it with you through private message or as an assignment on your platform, etc. But you can also combine this with speaking, and you can ask them if if they can to record themselves uh, using their cell phones. Okay, and I will have a, an, a speaking activity that. Uh, will help you or will guide you on how you can ask students to do this. But you can, you can do this in a way that is not just, um, not just writing in itself. But anyway, we can always make this cool using fake WhatsApps, okay? So like here, I created my fake WhatsApp for this presentation. And the reason why I suggest fake WhatsApp is in order to give this some sort of authenticity. So, for example, this is my dialogue. Hi, I'd like to ask uh, some information uh, about package holidays uh, to Egypt. It's so small they can barely read it. Of course, when would you like to travel and for how long? 
I was planning on visiting during November 10th to 17th. Okay, uh, would it be just one person or more? Okay, there is uh, this amazing uh, fake whatsapp.com slash generator tool that helps you uh, create this. You will use this if you're teaching the little ones that of course they don't have a cell phone and they don't have uh, WhatsApp. But if you're teaching teenagers or adults who do have a mobile and uh, have WhatsApp, what you can ask them to do is to simply have the conversation through WhatsApp and take screenshots of their cell phones and just send you the real screenshots. So there are different ways in which you can get them working interactively. Okay. The other one is what's my what's the story? Okay. Uh, in order to uh, do what's the story, we will need to get students to think of a story. Uh, they can do this again individually or in groups. For that, uh, because this is a story, they will be working with comic format. Okay, not uh, not just the narrative style. I would suggest doing the, the direct speech style. This is something then you can ask students to rewrite, to work with uh, direct or indirect speech or to work with different writing uh, uh, patterns, okay? And what I always like doing was, you know that in all the books there are different kind of comics like this, uh, especially in the grammar sections. That's why I selected this. Uh, this is a grammar activity to practice this and that, okay, to practice demonstratives, okay? But we can ask students to transform this into a story or something. Um, so you would ask students to um, work individually uh, or in groups, and you would ask them to write a story in dialogue format. Once they have all the dialogues, you're going to get students to illustrate the story uh, if they didn't select the, the, the images from the book um, they, they will illustrate it now I'm a really bad drawer okay like uh, as a cartoonist I would I would be living literally in the streets okay because I cannot even draw the sun so that's why I would benefit as a student if you, if you allow me to use any of the uh, images that appear in my book and you let me explore the book. Now, as you know, in the classroom, there are students who are linguistically gifted, but there are students who are more artistically gifted. So for those who are artistically gifted, they, they, they can simply draw and they can see, the, they can show you how uh, good they are, and they can illustrate their story. Now, if the student doesn't find uh, images in the book, what they can do is use this amazing website, which has always saved my life as a teacher, uh, in order to illustrate images for my instruction. This is the, the storyboardthat.com website. And in storyboardthat.com, uh, what you can do is you can create comics, okay? And they give you multiple scenarios, okay, to, for you to choose from. It could be a park, it could be in a house, it could be in a, in a shopping mall. It, if it is in a house, it can be in the kitchen, in the living room, in, it could be in an office. I mean, you can choose any context, you can choose any characters, you can change the hair color, the face, you can change the uh, position of arms. They can be sitting down, they can be standing up, they can be looking at you uh, face to face, they can be turning around. I mean, you can literally place the characters anywhere. You can select the type of speech bubble, okay? Whether they are just talking, whether they are shouting, whether they are asking questions, okay? Uh, it's fantastic, literally it's fantastic. You can have as many scenes as you, as you want, okay? so. You would, you, you would ask students to um, use this and to copy and paste the dialogue that they created and to put it here. And then they would have their comic strips, okay, uh, ready for you. Now, this is a website that you can work on everything for free online. And you can download your comic in PDF format. If you don't pay, what happens is that the, the, the PDF um, is created with the watermark of storyboard.com. 
but uh, again, the, the watermark that appears is a very light gray. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't um, obscure any uh, of the student's writing, so you can easily read it. And if not, you can always do the very illegal thing, which is to take a screenshot of the, as I did here, of what you're working on, and the students copy and paste that, and they 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 paste it in 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 a Word document, and then they wouldn't have any of the watermark from storyboardat.com. Uh, but again, this is fantastic. Teachers, colleagues, uh, friends. I always use this uh, for my classes whenever I was teaching grammar and I needed to create situations, okay? I, I would use that and I would take it into PowerPoint and I would have all the stories. And we are going to see how this can also be used for speaking purposes as well, okay? But this is, this is uh, uh, an activity. The other one is fake, that's fake news. In times where uh, fake news seem to be the protagonist of everything. Uh, I think, again, because I believe in developing critical thinking, I believe it's important that we work in the classroom with students about the importance of fake news and for them to understand that everything, uh, every piece of information needs to be cross-checked and uh, they need to detect what fake news are. And, but in order to detect what fake news are, sometimes it's good that we ask them to create fake news. So what we are going to do is we are going to ask students to write uh, a, a news article based on a task. It can be a task from your course book or a task that you created. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to ask them to write a reversion of your local newspaper news, but with wrong information. Okay, you're going to ask students to create their article and to put it together with two or more stories. Okay, um, now those two or more stories need to be true stories. Okay, so what will happen is that uh, students will end up with a news articles page that has two stories that are correct and one story that is incorrect or that is uh, has some misleading information. Now, there are two websites that I highly recommend for this because they are websites that really create um, pages that really look like a newspaper. And students can even think of the name of their newspaper, all right? The job is that uh, students will then post everything in their class forum and students will have to read at all the stories uh, will have to read all the stories sorry and they will need to say which of those stories is the fake one and why and they will um, also need to source the source the the, the, the the websites that they consulted in order to cross check the information so again, we are working with more extensive reading, but we are, uh, the focus is on writing. We're working at high levels of thinking, okay? And we are working with current affairs, okay? And how to keep students um, reading the newspapers. Um, if, uh, if another thing students can do, because for, in order for them not to transcribe, because probably our local websites are in Spanish, so what I asked my students to do was to go to like BBC websites or the New York Times websites or any kind of English speaking websites. Uh, and they simply copy and paste the, the two news that are not fake, all right? So this is up to you how complicated or not complicated you want to make this activity. But I really loved this uh, idea of um, working with the concept of fake news and uh, and helping students to to raise awareness um, about that. Okay, listening advantages for listening. Literally, there are three advantages that I can see. You can of course add more to the list. Uh, one of them is that uh, materials are updated and they are topical. Okay, online. Well, you you mention it. Most of the the things that you do online are is listening. Uh, so. That's why listening, it's very easy, uh, and you're aware of, of all this. The good thing is that there is lots of authentic material online, 
um, and that um, some of that material is even ELT commission material. So it's organized by not just by topic, but by level with uh, different uh, exam format activities. So everything is there. And the other good thing is that you can promote, you can generate, sorry, activities to promote more extensive listening than in the regular classroom. Now with all, now because we are exposing them to YouTube and podcasts and this and that, students, if you think at it, at it carefully, students are listening to more English than what they will listen to if they were in the classroom with us. So I think, I think there are at least those three activities, three, three advantages, sorry. And the first activity that I want to do that is not actually an activity is a reminder about online listening. Uh, online listening is very easy. That's why you said it. It's the activity you do the most. There are many, many, many websites out there that have tons of activities already pre-designed for you, okay? And they, can, they are activities that to work with different listening skills, there are uh, sub skills, sorry, there are activities to work with different exam format type of activities. Uh, there are uh, activities uh, that are organized by topic. So my piece of advice is go online and use those activities, okay? And ask students to do the activities and to share the results with you through private message. Why? Because the only negative thing about all this, as you know, is that these activities are in a third party website. Uh, so the results will not go to your platform uh, markbook, okay? Whether you're working with a uh, Richmond learning platform uh, or, or whether you're working with uh, a platform of your choice, such as uh, classrooms or whatever, that the reporting goes to the markbook, okay? at least ask students to get a screenshot of the results of the activities so that you can keep track of how they are doing. This is the only disadvantage that um, these sort of uh, uh, websites have, but just because of that disadvantage, I think we shouldn't um, discourage, uh, we shouldn't be discouraged from using that. Good, but let's go into activities. One of the, of the activities is my favorite podcast. This is an adaptation of the uh, uh, blog log activity for reading. As you can see, all the activities can be adapted. Uh, there are many podcasts uh, out there. So what you're going to do is you're going to share with students instructions in your blog. Again, remember, instructions always need to be very clear. So here are my instructions. I'm going to ask students to listen to at least three podcasts, okay? And they need to choose one, any podcast of their choice, and they need to choose one. Once they chose that podcast, they need to complete the description below. They need to give us the link, they need to tell us the topic of the podcast, they need to tell us why they like the podcast, and they also need to tell us how often a new podcast is produced. Remember that in podcast websites, um, they, they are launching podcasts, if it is an amazing website, it could be daily, but if not, generally weekly, okay? Um, then they need to post that to in the class forum. Uh, so all this information, the link, the topic, the why they like the website, and the curiosity of the uh, of the, um, the frequency of the posting of the website of the podcast what uh, students will have to do is students will have to listen to at least two podcasts from their classmates and they need to comment on them okay so you will uh, students will be asked to do this okay and to comment on the two podcasts okay what students should do is they need to listen to at least two or three episodes per month, okay, on that website. And they need to always be giving feedback. And here you build lots of interaction in terms of podcasts of choice and podcasts because uh, uh, of, sorry, podcasts of choice because of the assignment and podcasts of choice because of recommendation. And look at this look at all the listening that we are generating and all the writing that we are also generating naturally 
There are podcasts that I would like to recommend to you. Uh, there are many websites, but these are websites that I always used as a teacher. Okay, the Breaking News English. It's fantastic, okay, for all the current affairs, if you are into teaching current affairs. So is China 232. Um, you also have the ELT podcast. This is more for uh, instructional uh, listening um, skills. Uh, you would also have English conversations. This is fantastic if you want to, to expose students to uh, interactive listening. If you teach business English, ESL business uh, news is, is a good one I would like to recommend. You would also have the, ES, the ESL pod and podcast in English. Again, there are many, many websites many uh, with, with podcasts. This is just a short recommendation for you. Um, then, what's my line? This is a cool activity, not that the other ones were not, but I always love this because I'm a movie guy. So uh, what I ask my students to do is to look uh, for two film trailers. Let me recommend you these websites where you can always find all the movie trailers for the latest movies and from the historical movies. You have the trailers.apple.com website, uh, this is for Apple TV, so you would have all the trailers of all the movies. And then there is this amazing one from Yahoo, the uh, yahoo.com entertainment movies uh, website. Okay, and I don't know you guys, but I always loved working with film trailers because they are visually very impactful. The type of language is very concrete, so it's not that it really overwhelms students. and. St generally students are very into movies and especially when it's the latest movies. So what we will ask students to do is that we are going to ask them to we would ask them to write two trailers. So literally this is intensive listening at the level of dictation. Okay, because they will literally need to write word by word of two lines that are mentioned in the trailer. And we would ask them to create a line that is not mentioned. That is the made up line in the trailer. So by the end of the activity, students will end up with three lines, two that are authentic and loyal to, the, to what is said in the, in the trailer and one that is a made up line. Now, we need to remind them that the made up line needs to be, of course, connected to, to the trailer content, okay? To the trailer's content. Um, so once they have that, what we'll, we will ask them uh, to post the link to the trailer together with the, the three lines, okay? And look at this, if we have 200 students a year, we end up with 400 selection of trailers with 400 listening activities. And this is listening for specific information, listening for detail, because what we will ask students to do is once that everybody posted, students need to go to look for the trailers, to watch the trailers, listen to them, and detect which is the incorrect line in each trailer. Okay, so look at all the listening material that your students generated for you, okay? You can, if you don't want students to be overwhelmed because of all the listening, what you can ask them is to first give you the activities through private message, give you the link, give you the three sentences, and you start releasing every week you release or every day you release one or two of the students' activities, okay? And students would be very motivated to see that uh, you're using the content and that their classmates are looking for, for, for the, uh, the lines, all right? So this is a way of, again, empowering students and also you getting lots of material for free, custom made by your students, okay? Good. The uh, last listening activity I wanted to share with you is the spot the difference. Again, this is an adaptation of the writing activity, 
uh, remember the writing activity in which we ask them to detect the fake news. This is something similar because what we are going to do, this demands a little bit of work from us, but you will see in the end it will be worth because you will have lots of material that your students will create for you. You will select a news, uh, a piece of news uh, from uh, any local website, or it can be from uh, an international website that is in English. And you will copy and paste the original piece of news on the platform. Again, any, any news website like this one. What you will do next is you will uh, record yourself retelling the story. You know why I created this activity? You know that many of our uh, news programs on TV, they, they have the news program live and you see the reporters telling the story, but then they have a website and they write the story. Sometimes there, is, there are mismatches between what is written in the same news program a website to what is being said. And the reason is because in the, in the website, they can update the information. So what we are going to do is we are going to play with students. So we are going to record the story. We are going to play the role of reporters, but we are going to make some changes to the original stories. What students will have to do is, students will have to read to the, the story and students will have to listen to, to our original version of the, of the recording and they need to spot the differences, okay? So this is, again, working with two different sources, the reading and the audio, uh, the written and the auditory one and they need to spot the differences, okay? So this is fantastic. And of course, we will ask them to do the same. We will ask them to look for a story and to record um, a different version, okay, of the, of the news with some mistakes. And again, you will be uh, sharing that with the class and students will need to listen to, to a lot of things, okay? Um, this can be adapted uh, for speaking. It would be good that they, they record themselves. Uh, for writing, it would be good that they use something that is recorded, like a YouTube uh, video, and then they, they write the, the piece of news with the changes. So depending on which skill you want to practice uh, with students, how you will do this activity. Right. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is speaking. Um, in terms of uh, advantages, I think one of the advantages students can practice speaking skills with you uh, at any time during the class or even after class. It's not now. It's not that they only see you in class now, so they can be doing speaking asynchronically by recording themselves and then you can uh, listen to their speaking and you can give them feedback. So I think this is a way of, uh, for students to know that they can be corrected at different moments of the lesson. Now, by this, I'm not saying that we should work 24 seven, okay? And you will see that uh, probably you detected that I'm, I'm a fan of really empowering students so that we have a better quality of life with all this. But we, we can do a synchronic correction as well, okay? And that is a benefit, we like it or not. The other thing is that you can bring in guests from anywhere in the world. And this is fantastic. Uh, I think that there is no English teacher in the world who doesn't have a friend who's an English speaker uh, out there, whether in the US, UK, Ireland, uh, South Africa, Australia, Canada, uh, Jamaica, you name it, okay? We have English speakers who are friends of us uh, out there, and now it's the opportunity of bringing guests into our classes, okay? Let's benefit from that. I don't know how many of you have realized that now you don't need to pay for plane tickets in order to have English speakers in the classroom, okay? So bring in guests, okay? And um, 
ask them to work with your students, okay, to practice English, okay? This can be done through Skype, through Zoom, uh, any platform that you use, okay? Uh, and it's the opportunity for them to also be exposed to um, English uh, speakers and play with different accents at the same time. I'm not a believer about the native speaker thing, uh, but I am a believer of the variety of accents, okay? And now it's the opportunity. We can do this uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the other thing is that you can closely monitor your students' speakers uh, speaking and give them more feedback than in the face-to-face. -face. Because if we are working with speaking asynchronically, we can give them better and more detailed feedback in terms of their uh, segmental, their, their sounds, so all the segmental thing, the, the stress, the sounds, the intonation, uh, sorry, intonation would be super segmental, okay? But we can give them more, more, uh, more feedback and, and more precise one. And the other thing is that you can create, and this is really cool, I think, we can create a speaking portfolio uh, with all the recordings, okay? Student, we can create a portfolio and we can see how students have improved and students can resend the recording, okay, in order to improve and uh, in order to, to see the improvement. And you will see that some of the activities that I will suggest, they are activities that are fantastic to measure progress. So, first activity is the class lecturer. Some students love lecturing. They love lecturing about everything. They know everything. So let's get them, uh, let's give them that role and let's help them become the lecturer of our lessons. And at the same time, this will, give, this will save us lots of time of uh, creating audio material. This is connected to the speaking material, uh, to the speaking activity of the news that I mentioned before. What we are going to ask students is we are going to get students to record themselves lecturing on any specific topic. You can give them the topic or they can choose the topic themselves. That's why uh, I say that we can connect this with the idea of the, the news, uh, the piece of news in audio and in writing uh, format. We are going to ask students to design six or eight comprehension activity questions. Uh, sorry, comprehension question activity. Uh, and uh, they will post this, their audio, with the questions uh, in the forum. Again, if you don't want students to have from one day to the other, if, they, if you don't want them to have to listen to 20 recordings, and answer uh, 120 questions, what you will do is you will ask students to um, send all the material through private message and you will be administrating the, the material weekly, okay? Uh, if some students are really good, you will immediately post that material. If some students are not really good, you will ask them to re-record themselves okay, with your feedback, and that will be part of the speaking portfolio. But um, the thing is, you will ask students to record themselves, to produce the questions, and you will have lots of listening input material to give to your students. The other activity I thought of is the challenge thing, the tongue twister challenge. And the reason why I selected this is because actually, I'm going to be very honest, I got inspired on the toilet paper challenge that the footballers uh, created. Uh, and then I started looking at uh, how all these famous people are creating ch challenges. There is like the uh, crunches challenge as well. So many people are challenging everybody online in these COVID times of confinement uh, and lockdown. So um, I said, it's like, oh, this could be something cool to do in the classroom to create a tongue twister challenge. But of course, remember that in order to play challenges online, you always, whoever uh, challenges someone needs to role model the challenge. So what we are going to do, I thought is, uh, tongue twisters are good because they are difficult and uh, they are a challenge in themselves. 
So we are going to record ourselves saying a tongue twister, okay? Uh, I know this can be done in writing. That's why I also suggested this for writing. Uh, that if you're if you're a coward, you will just present it the, the the written version. I think that if we are going to challenge, we need to present the recorded version of ourselves saying the challenge and challenging our students. Okay, so we are going to present a tongue twister in writing and also record it, and we are going to ask students to record themselves saying the tongue twister three times. Now, they need to say the tongue twister three times because they need to show us that they can do it at three different levels of speed, low, mid, and high level, okay? Uh, and the challenge is whether they can say fast and better than us. And I think this is really cool because of course students can be better than us and that is fun, okay? Now, you will challenge the entire class, but they should also start challenging their classmates and you. So you would ask them to go online and to look for tongue twisters in English and to practice them. And once they master it, they start posing the challenge to us, okay, and the classmates. So they will upload the recording of them saying the, the tongue twister and challenging other people, okay? And please, please, please take part of these challenges. If a student dares challenge someone, so if a student is in, intrinsically motivated enough to go to look for a, for a tongue twister and to uh, record it and challenge uh, everybody, you should also be part of that, of that challenge. And tongue twisters are fantastic to practice speaking, especially at the segmental level. You know that tongue twisters are uh, fantastic for minimal pairs, specific sound production, okay? So it's fantastic to practice speaking at that level, okay? The other activity I wanted to share with you is the PowerPoint storytelling. Um, this is a way of combining many things that we have been looking at. What we are going to do is we are going to ask students to create a, slide, a PowerPoint slideshow to tell a story. This can be a story that they wrote in any of your writing activities, a story that they read in any of your reading activities, Remember that we ask students to draw stories and that we, to use storyboard.com. So again, these are act, speaking activities to build up on what we did. What we are going to do is we are going to ask students to record a video of their own retelling the story. Probably they wrote, they worked with an activity in, for writing purposes and they did it in narrative now you can ask them to do it in a dialogue format, or you can ask them to become the narrators and to make voices, et cetera, et cetera. What they will need to do is they will need to illustrate the story. They can illustrate it using their own drawings, or they can use storyboard.com, okay? And they would use, they would, uh, use PowerPoint. Each slide of PowerPoint would be an image. Then they, I, love using QuickTime Player. QuickTime Player gives you the opportunity of recording the, uh, the screen in your computer, okay? And also record the voice. Something that uh, probably you notice is that all the speaking activities I'm suggesting here, they are not video activities, okay? I am really, I have always been very cautious about students not recording their faces because I really don't want my students' images to be out there in the internet. And because mommy and daddy may complain about this, my school principal or my director of study may complain about this. So all the activities that I'm suggesting that demand recording are voice recording activities, okay? Uh, and this is something that we can do with QuickTime. So students will record themselves. And this is, again, it's kind of like lecturing, but at this point, students can be playing, can be making voices, okay? And it's really cool. And if students are not good at writing, but they are good at speaking, they would really enjoy this buildup of the written activity 
to transform it into a storing activity. So then student, they will tell students, uh, you will tell students to post the videos, uh, okay, um, in the class forum together with some comprehension questions. And again, you would have, this will transform into listening and you would have more, more input to give to your students. I don't know if you have realized all the, activi the activities that I'm suggesting that they are fully student-centered and most importantly, they are students, producers and creators of materials that then we will recycle. And in the meantime, we will have time at the end of every single day to enjoy uh, our family, okay, to go and to cook and to not to go out because we are in lockdown. But really, something that is very important for me is that you guys, uh, because we are colleagues, that we do not let COVID overwhelm us and make us work more hours than necessary, okay? During the first days, yes, but not at these points. At this point, we should get students producing lots of material and us being good administrators of material, okay, and, and get students to, to practice English and to learn English. Now, recording course book tasks. Um, the reason why I selected this activity is because all the activities that I mentioned before they are not interactive activities and speaking should also be uh, interactive, okay, because that's communication. I mean, it's important that we develop presentation skills, that we develop uh, debate skills, etc. And during debates and presentations and all that, it's speeches and students need to know how to speak uh, for long periods of time. But it's also true that the ability of speaking has to do with the interaction thing. So we also need to develop that uh, online. Now, if you don't have the opportunity of doing this uh, synchronically through breakout rooms, breakout rooms, and I'm going to just divert from the presentation a little bit. If you use Zoom, when you generate uh, a Zoom session, for those who know Zoom, you would have the possibility, uh, you need to go to settings and to activate the idea of uh, the, the, um, the link for breakout rooms. If you do that, whenever you are in a, in a Zoom, as uh, an administrator, you would have a uh, you, you would have uh, a little box there at the bottom that says uh, breakout rooms or they can be like four little boxes together. You click there and you can start assigning rooms, uh, students to different rooms. And then you enter the rooms, okay? Uh, but that is another presentation and I need to round up because we have been uh, working we have been working a lot uh and i need to round up sorry so um let's say that we have this page from the book this is an interaction page from the book and what we see is that students um uh, always have the the activities model so what we are going to do uh is to ask students to create the final version in recorded for that we will ask them to use whatsapp they can call each other and they will use their voice notes in their mobile phone okay so as they are uh, talking on the phone they also they are also recording their conversation uh, with their notes uh, with their voice notes in the in the mobile once they have that audio they will simply share the audio with you they will upload it to the platform depending on the function that you have and you will have the possibility of listening to your students interacting and practicing the dialogue so all the activities that are interaction activities from your course book this is how simply you can do it if there are little ones mommy and daddy will sure have the phones okay and one of the mommies or the daddies they can do it uh, and then they can send you the the audio material so there is a way of uh, recording the interaction thing. And the last activity is to ask our students to become kind of like YouTubers. You know how uh, in YouTube there are these people that recommend products and things like that. 
um, I thought about uh, asking students to create uh, videos, again, using QuickTime Player, of their favorite website, okay? So what we will ask, my favorite website is the Richmond website. What we will ask students to do is, um, we will ask students to record themselves. They will screenshot uh, through with QuickTime the, the website, and they will be talking about the website. Come and visit this website. It's a fantastic website if you want to learn this and that. So you, they, they will be talking about uh, the features of the website. They will describe special sections in the website. They will give uh, an overall opinion. And this will also give us information about which websites they're they are, uh, looking at. This can be connected to the five click away reading activity that we, that we mentioned, okay, uh, at the beginning. And we can see our students doing uh, speaking for a more marketing purposes. Of course, then they will share this with their classmates and you will get the classmates um, uh, giving opinions, okay? So, oops, sorry. Um, I think we discussed both of, uh, both of uh, the, the topics for our agenda. We talked about the advantages of all the language skills and we saw how you can combine the course book uh, together with the online resources to really enrich uh, the classes. Something that I really wanted to, to finish with is this idea that if we do not work together, if we do not work collaboratively, these online times will be a real nightmare for us. Remember, you really need to empower your students. You are not alone here. Students are the creators of materials. Okay, let them create, let them be at the center, and you just become the best administrator ever of material while you enjoy the COVID times as much as possible. All right, so thank you so very much for your time. Uh, it has been a pleasure. I know this took a bit longer, but I really wanted to be clear with all the activities. I'm going to look at the chat room now. Uh, Lots of thank yous, uh, um, and I don't know, Hime. Well, that's what we're getting. Lots of thank yous, congratulations, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to remind teachers that for access to the recordings of our webinars, they should contact their local Richmond representatives. Recordings will be made available by your local Richmond teams. Again, Nico, thank you very much for a wonderful webinar. Uh, great tips, great ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you to all the teachers that joined us today. Gracias, Nico. And see you in a bit in a different scenario. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.